Namaskaram and a very good morning and a warm welcome to our honorary member, Ms. Shiv Shankari, our guest speaker, Malati Ramachandran, moderator, our member Kala Ashok, all the Duchess members and all those friends who have joined us for the meeting today. We at the Duchess Club have had numerous book launches, be it be cookbooks or books by famous authors. I am very glad to announce today the launch of the Duchess Book Club, Page Turners at Duchess. We are honored to have our very own honorary member, Ms. Shiv Shankari, as our mentor and patron for the book club. The club will be spearheaded by our members Pramila Rajan and Aparna Bhubna with support from Rati Nilakantan and myself. Thank you Sujata for putting up the poster. I would now give an introduction to Pramila Rajan. Pramila Rajan is a proud uh, I think somebody is, uh, uh, somebody is on uh, the video and this thing is on, Sujata. Please, members, do not switch on your videos and stay on mute. Yes, Anu. Yes, yeah. Pramila Rajan is a proud army wife with double postgraduate degrees in education and English besides a degree in biology, an educator and administrator for over 37 years. She has been a founder principal in schools at India and the UAE. An avid reader, an intrepid traveler, she is passionate about art, theater and drama, literature, history and spirituality. She is a registered homeopath. A keen blogger, her pursuits have culminated in her book of memoirs, 80 Wondrous Years, published just two weeks ago. A member of the Duchess Club since two and a half years, she is very happy to be associated with the book club, Page Turners at Duchess. Pramila, can we have you on the screen to talk about the, our club, the newly launched club? Thank you so much, Anu. Welcome to everyone. Good morning, folks. It is my pleasure to be nominated to the team to start the book club for the Duchess. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Blast off. Yay. <laughs> Our official handle for this newly minted book club is Page Turners at Duchess. I look forward to work alongside Aparna Bhubma, Rati Nalekantan, and Anu Agarwal on this amazing and enlightening venture. It is indeed an exciting moment for all readers. Page Turners at Duchess hopes to involve its members on a fantastic journey of exploration into the mysteries of the written word. We shall travel together through reading sessions, animated discussions, business conversations, and reach out to our gray cells. Later, we shall venture out to libraries, cafes, and parks once the lockdown is lifted. Members of the Page Turners will bond together through the magic world of books. Today, as we officially launch our Page Turners at the Duchess, with the fans are so apt and suited as we have our esteemed patron and mentor, Ms. Madam Shiva Shankari, with us. I think of no better way than this, our initial offering day, which will follow after we finish the official business. And that involves a revolving conversation between our Duchess Club member, Kalavati Ashok, and the author, Malati Ramachandran, on the latter's newly released historical romance, Mandu. Thank you and welcome to Page Turner. Thank you. Thank you, Pramila. That was beautiful. 
Now I give a small intro to Aparna Bhubna. Aparna is an educator by profession with a love for biographies, forever inspired by them. As a trailing spouse, have had the privilege to live in different places, both overseas and in India. This helped her to pursue her passion for travel, knowing different cultures and meeting people from all walks of life. She likes to keep herself busy, be it be meeting friends, art, creativity, practicing Buddhism, movies, cooking, and volunteering with NGOs. She has been a member with the Duchess Club since the last 10 months. Aparna, I now ask you to please uh, introduce our ma'am, Ms. Shiv Shankar. Thank you, Anu. That was a lovely introduction. And it's my pleasure to welcome Ms. Shivashankri. Something about her, Ms. Shivashankri is a famous Tamil writer and activist from Chennai. Known as a multifaceted personality, she has won many prestigious awards, some being the Kasturi, Kasturi Srivanasan Award and Woman of the Year Award by the International Women's Association 1999-2000. She switched to writing from her career as a classical dancer. She writes on the different crises existed in the society, mostly contemporary issues. Her novel, Oru Mandanin Kadhai, uh, about a drunkard made her a huge sensation overnight. Her ambitious project, Knit India Through Literature, gained nationwide attention. As a writer in a career spanning over four decades, she has contributed to Tamil literature. She has 30 novels, 150 short stories, and 13 trap dogs uh, Many of her works have been translated to Indian and foreign languages. Many famous Tamil directors have adapted her novels for movies. Her novel Kuti on Girl Child Labor was, late, was made to a national award winning feature film. We'll conclude with her words by saying that living and aging gracefully with peace and contentment is her focus for now. Thank you, Ms. Shivishantri, and look forward for you to being our patron. Over to you, Anu. Thank you, Pramila and Aparna, for volunteering and spearheading page turners. And uh, once again, ma'am, thank you for agreeing to be our mentor and patron. We would like to hear some words from you for our upcoming club now. Good morning, everybody. It's lovely to meet all of you after a long time. I hope all of you, everybody in your family, are safe and good. Nina has been talking to me about launching a book club for quite a few years. And only today, the time seems to have come for it to happen. I'm extremely happy to be the patron <laughs> member and also to launch this wonderful wing of Duchess Club, the book club, the page turner. And I'm sure every one of us will have wonderful time participating in its activities. Uh, to me, <clears throat> like food, water, and air, I believe that exposure to fine arts uh, will help a person to grow holistically. Your music can soothe you, a good piece of music can give you soleil. Similarly, a good book, I, I personally feel, can be a teacher, a guide, a friend, and a companion to the reader. I've been a writer for 52 years. Got frozen. Yeah. Yeah. You must be speaking also. Hello. Hello. Yeah. 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 yeah, 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 yeah he lost you for a moment. Can I go ahead? Yes. 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 Yeah. Many people have come and told me, not few, many people have come and told me, readers, that uh, certain book has helped them. Uh, to solve a problem of that. 
and certain book has given them a new perspective about life and certain book has helped them to develop their individuality you know all these things are very true a good book can do all these things to the reader a um, malayalam poet kamala das used to tell me you know many times that good literature is should be like a second skin to the person so close so personal it becomes a second skin to the reader how beautiful isn't it similarly uh, the great writer mt vasudevan nair also has shared a beautiful thought with me he always used to tell me that reading a book is like getting a love letter from the loved one <laughs> why because you you hold it close you smell the book <laughs> you go through it page by page and you stop sometimes contemplate on what you have read use your own thinking to add on something to it turn the previous page to go through it again and you know it's a beautiful experience so he always said reading a book is so personal that it is like getting a love letter from the loved one another writer sindhi writer many of you may not have heard of him because he's uh, he he writes in sindhi his name is lal pushp he also gave me a beautiful thought when i met him he said every good book brings out the creator or the writer in the reader i mean it's fascinating i asked him how and he said we writers write a short story or a novel or whatever it is and once it is published our Ooh. work is over but the reader when he picks it up like empty said with his close relationship with the book and the happenings of the book many readers start imagining their own they may not agree with the conversation we have written so they might create their own conversation they might like to change the end of the book you know certain happenings certain incidents so they all become writers the creativity in a person comes out when a good book is read it motivates them their thinking so in many ways reading a good book is always a great great not only happiness but it's it's a benefit to every one of us a lot of people in the recent time have been asking me whether the reading habit is diminishing well to go back a little in up to 80s you know there were no diversions at all it was only books and magazines few theaters and few concerts but not on the regular basis but every day everybody spent time they waited for the magazines to arrive they waited for the new books to arrive and they read it repeatedly and discussed it and they they, they sort of adored the writers who wrote the best stories they liked i mean they had a lot of time to spend with literature but it's not so now so many other things are eating up our time whatsapp facebook instagram internet tv serials i mean name it thousand channels and so many movies to see and the time just is not sufficient to sit and read because uh the other uh, medium like visual medium is multi it engages your ear it engages your eye it's colorful there is music there's dance there's acting so few people might have reduced their reading i do agree but today's youngsters or even um, people some of us slowly we are shifting from physical book to ebooks a uh, ebook publisher of mine pustaka.com he tells me in the last 5 months the ebook sales have multiplied so many times because people sitting at home 
they find it much easier to download a book. And these days you can rent a book also. You don't have to buy it because storing, we're all living in flats. The storage becomes a problem. And one more problem is, previously when we used to travel, we always carried some books with us, books with us. I mean, how many we could carry? Four, maximum six. Otherwise, the weight of the whole thing becomes too much and uh, uh, the weightage limitations are there. But today, with one single Kindle or with downloading these e-books, you can carry 100 books with you. If you feel like reading a romance, you can read. If you feel like reading a spiritual book, Every, the choice is yours. Hundred books are there with you. But this reading habit has to come from the childhood days. Otherwise, playing the video game today, most of the children, they spend their time in playing the video games, which are violent. And to some extent, the psychiatrists say they're all harmful during the growing period. <clears throat> so we should cultivate the reading habit. If children are not reading as much as we did in our younger age, today's children, it's not, <clears throat> sorry, their fault. It is our fault. We have not inculcated the love for books right from childhood. How many of us tell bedtime stories to our children or grandchildren, spend time with them instead of making them watching the cartoons and other things in the TV? You know, storytelling is an art. Through that, you make them start reading the book, picture books. Then on their birthday and other occasions, along with other gifts, how many of us buy two or three books also for the child? So that the child understands the book is a part of its life. Then starts enjoying reading. And once this habit is settled, it, it sort of goes inside you, roots itself. Then nothing can stop it. You go on and on and on searching for good books, you know. So uh, the reading habit, it's up to us to cultivate it, keep it going, because books can be the best, as I told you earlier, teacher, guide, companion, and friend. Before I finish, I just want to share one incident. <clears throat> which happened just 10 days before. Um, I was in a Zoom meeting. Many of my um, readers were participating, asking questions. And some of them came out with their uh, reviews or about their statements about some of my books. And one lady by name Kala, what she said was something so unusual for me. I've heard all kinds of compliments or uh, reviews in this 52 years, but what this lady Kala told me was something, uh, I mean, uh, stunning for me. She lost her mother two years before. And before dying, before four or five years, the mother had had Alzheimer's. She has been slowly developing Alzheimer's and I believe it came to a point where she could not even recognize her own children. But you know what she did? She was an avid reader before and I believe she liked a lot of my stories. And one particular book called Palangan. After she became completely hit by Alzheimer's when she could not even recognize her own children, she kept Palangal book with her, and I believe she read two chapters or three chapters every day sincerely. And the doctor who saw her said to Kala that this book is obviously giving her security and comfort. So Kala told me, Madam, I just Sujata, she's frozen again, Sujata. Yeah. Yeah. So, that's yeah. It. so that, that was a, I had tears in my eyes when I heard it, you know, because it was so touching, so moving. If a book can give solace even to a patient who is 
afflicted by Alzheimer's, a good book can do wonders. Wonders. It's up to us to pick the right book and go through it and get ourselves motivated. So I wish all the members of uh, Turn a Page Book Club all the best. And I'm sure we'll have great activities happening here <clears throat> around through the year, which will immensely benefit us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Duchess Club. All the best. Thank you, Amma. Thank you so much. You are always so, so, so inspiring that we can just go on listening to you. And I'm sure with your guidance, the page turners at Duchess is just going to rock with all your ideas given to us. Thank you so much. And if time permits you, ma'am, please, we would like you to be there for the rest of the meeting also. Uh, I cannot be for the whole meeting because I have some other work, but I'll be here certainly for the next 10-15 minutes. Sure, sure, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you Thank so you. much. And uh, now I hand over to Anu to uh, carry on with the proceedings of the meeting. Thank you, Sujata. Good morning, everybody. And Namaskara, Ma. Your words for our book club were so found and so true. We indeed are privileged to have you as our honorary member and patron of H. Turner's at the Books Club. Thank you, Ma. Your in-depth meaning of reading and what source and inspiration it gives us is so, so powerful. So, thank you so much, Amma. And you've always been a pillar of support and guidance for our Dutch club. I'd like to invite Nina, Sujata, and Rai to say a few words and give our club best wishes. Sujata, Nina, could you unmute Nina? Am I going now? Can I say a few words? Yeah. God, I mean, Amma took me back onto into my childhood straight away, you know, and I was just thinking, I have actually been an avid reader for always. And I think uh, I have inspired by my father because daddy used to always read and he still reads a lot of books. And um, I've inculcated the same habit into my children and into my grandchildren now. And Amma, you're right, nothing like a good book or a good companionship. That's all. Nothing beats it. Um, coming back to the book club, um, I think I've always wanted to be simply Amma to hear it because I mean, I mean, we're so fortunate to have someone like her amidst us, and we've not even really like reached out to her to be a part of it, you know. So I'm so glad she's a part of it today. But I guess everything required a certain amount of time to get here. Ever too late. So I'm so glad she was Amma is with us, and love you, Amma, for being with us for anything. Coming back to the people who are going to be in charge of that, uh, yes, Rati and Anu Agarwal are going to be directly in charge of that, along with uh, who else but someone like Pramila Rajan, who is like a multifaceted personality and she's got the maturity to do things uh, you know, very well from here. So good luck to you, uh, Pramila. I know you're going to take the page turners to new heights. And she's going to be ably assisted by Aparna. So good luck, girls. And here in Dutch Club, everyone is a girl, even if you're 95 years, right? So, okay, so good luck to you all. And let the book club take off. Jata, yes. a few words from you. Yes. All the best, Pramila, Aparna, for me to be leading us page turners. Yes, along with our able Rati and Anu, who are going to be supporting them for the book club. Wishing you all the best. Yes, Rati. Thank you, Sujata. Rati? Uh, yeah. Page turners at Duchess, definitely a dream come true for us. A fresh new beginning. Sure, our book club will gain momentum pretty fast and keep us all engaged. I'm sure Premila and Aparna have lots up their sleeves and certainly looking forward. Thank you, Shiva Shankri, ma'am, for being for consenting to be our patron and well wisher. We are truly blessed. Thank you all. Thank you, Rati. All the best to Pila and Parna. You really are going to, I mean, Page Turner is going to take off. Good luck to both of you. 
So I think now we get back to today's uh, meeting. Uh, welcome, Mari. Thank you for addressing our club today. A few words on Malti. Malti Ramachandran is a master in mass communication who began freelancing by dabbling in features travel writings until she found her day in fiction. Her short stories have been extensively published in magazines and anthologies. Two of them won prizes in British Council short fiction contest. Her debut novel, The We Turn, was published in 1910 and is a love story set against the backdrop of military action in the Northeast during the year 16. Her second novel, End of All the Light 2013, deals with cross-cultural dilemmas of a young woman at the turn of the century who was abroad to see and work. Both books have been acclaimed readers and kids alike. Malti's last two novels are in the genre of historical fiction. They are The Legend of Puldhara and Mandu, The Romance of Rupmati and Babahadur. These are century-old legends that have recreated by the author, transporting us effortlessly to those worlds and those times in the past. Malti is also an avid reader, an amateur artist, and an ardent traveler as the daughter of an army officer and as a wife of an Indian Air Force fighter pilot, she has traveled widely, both within the country and abroad. Her passion for the history and cultural heritage of the country takes her, a little known takes her to little known towns and hamlets where she often finds stories to share. Malti also conducts safe writing workshops for adults and children under the brand Melting Point. Welcome, Malti. Now, a little introduction about our dear member, Kala, who is speaking graciously to the conversation with Malti. Kala, who is proud to be a member of the Duchess Club. She is an avid reader. Subjects of interest are history and anthology, a classical singer, and also very passionate about animal welfare. She is an active member of the Friends of Fari's group of the Duchess. Knowing Malti as an Air Force wife, she has had the opportunity of traveling with the author and has had the privilege of hearing narration of her fictional stories in their sketch form. She is truly excited to see stories narrated to her in print and also getting the opportunity to converse with her friend. Malti Ramachandran. Without further ado, looking forward to a fabulous, fabulous presentation with Kala Malti. Over to you, Kala. Thank you. <clears throat> Good morning, friends, and I'm so truly excited to be here to interview my own very good friend. So, at the outset, I would like to uh, say a big namaskaram to Shivashankari Amma and congratulate Pramila Rajan on her book too. It's wonderful that we have both of you on board on this uh, launch of our new book club. Malati Ramachandran is known to be for almost uh, four decades now. Her husband and uh, mine have gone through the portals of the National Defense Academy and then served in the Indian Air Force together. So we lady wives also get on like house on fire because of our long association. So we definitely meet at least once a year and during that time we travel together and it is always Malati who curates these travels, isn't it? And whenever I meet her, the first question that she pop to me is, what's happening in your Duchess club? So here you are, Malati, welcome aboard. I'm so happy to bring you over to the Duchess Club platform to talk about your work. So without much ado, I would like to just start your uh, 
latest book that is uh, mandu first of all i would like to uh, start by asking you what drew you to historical fiction you have been writing before uh, this is uh, these books are uh, your third and the fourth book is as historical fiction the legend of kundara and mandu so please tell us how your journey kind of took a turn thank you kala nice to speak to you. i mean we do speak very often but this is something really nice face to face on zoom and uh, i just want to first i want to thank all the das club and all its members for having me here today for a conversation on my book and especially i want to say hello to shivshank ma'am it's great to talk to meet her always and also share the same platform even for a few minutes it's a wonderful feeling so thank you so much to all of you for having me today and kala i'll answer your question about um, historical fiction why did i get to why did i get into historical fiction well it's like this i am a writer who has been writing uh, fiction for a long time more than 10 12 years now i have i started off with short stories then i wrote two novels which were not exactly on historical fiction but there was a little bit of military history in them. and the other one more of a general nature but uh, the reason why i went to this is because i'm extremely passionate about history and i read a lot of history and every time i would read history, uh, history historical what is known as historical fiction but they are basically well researched tomes on history on uh, you know a bit of history so when i read them i always used to feel that i love to know what happened in minds of people who lived out those times so it started becoming a sort of curiosity in me so when we visited uh, the first time it happened to me was when we visited jaisalmer on a normal tourist uh, holiday and uh, we went to this little village uh, deep in the desert just outside jaisalmer it's in the desert uh, which is called kulna and then we heard it's an abandoned village it just looks like there's been an earthquake there some time back ever so long so then i said i found it uh, very intriguing and we heard the guide telling us the story of what happened how the whole village was abandoned overnight 200 years back so yes you can see the pictures over there this is beautiful sujata thank you for putting it at the right time this is one of the houses that had uh, that is that survived the abandoned 200 years back and then you have you know streets of houses with fallen they were just walls they were just stairs going away so this had a very interesting story behind it and i thought that we uh, you know uh, i i was curious to know what people there in that village would have gone through they had to leave village over it literally just in a few hours they had to leave the village for certain reasons which i'll tell you later but this gave me and i said let me write about this from the point of view of the people who actually went through it. because in three books you have one single line over there where is that the uh, ravel sahab in 200 year act the ravel sahab of chelme had increased the tax on these people they were pagal brahmans this village and then there, there was something else happened and they suddenly which made us leave so this uh, one reason that uh, this is the first book that me i wanted to write this book on because of this curiosity in me to know the human element of this story. then second book mandu that again was a similar thing where i had uh, we had traveled to madhya pradesh and we had gone to see um, on alba plateau there is the o fortress is more than a thousand years old and uh, we heard the story of this abandoned fortress it's a huge fortress city so when we then we saw this we i felt the story too so then again i wrote early based on Uh, what it heard i got inspired the very basic story i heard it then of course a lot of research goes to it when i came and then i wrote it so historic fiction form is a framework of facts and events and timeline or into which build a tapestry of feel thoughts people relations so basically what you're looking at is the tapestry but you're going to it's holding together because of the historical fact yes so actually that picture that she showed about uh, kuldara the village abandoned village yes. i mean it looks so surreal i mean you can't imagine that for uh, almost two centuries you said it's been abandoned and it's almost yes. the same state uh, still in the ruins and uh, and when you get, i have of course read your book and it's uh, so fascinating and i suppose a, a picture like that triggers the curiosity in a person who is a writer of course uh-huh. and then 
you start doing your research into it. So can you just give us briefly um, something about Kuldera because that was a, a very, very well received book. So tell us how you went about uh, when you went there and, and how did you really, your um, you know, description of the landscape, etc. is uh, so vivid. So we'd like to know more about that. Okay. Okay. I can do a very brief line of the story first that people what I'm thinking about. So 200 years back, just about four years short of 200 years, I would say, the, what happened was uh, the, the Maharaval Sahib of Jaisalme had decided to increase the taxes and through his prime minister, actually his prime minister was the man who was extremely at the helm of things and he had taken a decision that would now uh, increase the taxes on the Paliwal Brahmins. There were actually 84 villages of Paliwal Brahmins and uh, one of them was Udhara. So these people were protesting because they had worked very hard to come up to this prosperity level. And they said, no, we don't want to. There was this little tug of war going on, Prime Minister, that is the Divan Sahib. And Divan Sahib Salim Singh one day rode into their village to see exactly how things are. And he saw that they were extremely prosperous. They had beautiful green fields full of crops and they had livestock, they had everything. So he, he wanted to increase the taxes exponentially. But uh, then he spotted the uh, the headman, the headman's daughter, young girl, young girl, just about 16 or 17. He saw her and he said, I will waive off all the taxes, extra taxes, if you send girl tomorrow morning. He said, actually, I have no choice. I have to send her my away tomorrow. And he was a nicer. He already had four wives. And this girl had just been one more in the Haveli. So uh, then he went back. Very confident I would send because they would, he thought they would more interest to reduce their taxes, their liability to the state. But um, overnight, the uh, village of Dhara, the people sent messages to the IT3 villages and they all decided to save water's honor, we are going to leave. So they, they just packed their basic stuff, they took all their livestock and they just left overnight. And within days, they had just disappeared from the face of the earth. That is all that history tells us. So I had built on this. And my basic idea was to explore feelings, emotions, the relationship that people in those villages had. And then what happened? But after that, it is fiction. Because I have uh, taken the story from there and then built on this girl. I've called her Pari and then built on her story. And the story was also, she's to a point of real penis. That's, uh, she's, uh, she's running away because there's a man who wants to take her away. And she has no choice if she doesn't run away. And so uh, she finally, at the end of the book, you see she comes out very, very strong. So that is her. And uh, if you, you ask me about the authenticity of the details and the uh, descriptions, I'll say that uh, I was very lucky because as an FOS officer's wife, uh, we, uh, I have lived in a small desert town right in the middle of the desert. Because two years, we were, my husband was put there in uh, a small place yes, uh, outside uh, in the desert. Right? Surat Ghai? Yes, Surat. We were very close to the border and this is just in the desert. So we experienced the moods of the desert. We saw the sunsets, we saw everything there, the grit and the, the grit in your food, the sand gets into your food, it gets into your eyes. It's, a, it's an experience actually. So when I've seen all that, I could uh, you know, sort of replicate it again very beautifully. I could express my feelings and how it would have been. Lovely, lovely. So, um, uh, from there, how was your research into this book? Briefly, we, we would like to move into more, um, talking more about Mandu, but uh, your research part, yes. you know, for history, you need a lot of um, research work to be done. And then when you turn it into fiction, yes. um, you have to be, uh, yes. do you think there are certain constraints when you um, uh, make a fiction out of uh, your um, basic story? I mean, uh, so... Yes. How how much how many yeah, details? Uh, are yeah, I think actually the answer to that would be yeah. Okay, so in this case, not much, very little detail. So it was easy for me to build on that my imagination. I had information like a, a British resident in Delhi. He was in charge of Rajputana and he had an agent, a, what is this, a political agent in Mount Abu. So th these two had a relationship where, you know, they were always at loggerheads. And this, he was uh, Rajputana, sorry, uh, in Abu. The man was a political agent in Abu, he used to come to Jaisalme often. He used to uh, talk to Salim and they both had a clash of egos. So all that is wrong history. And the, 
had him. But otherwise, uh, beyond the basic facts about Salim Singh, his cruelty and his, uh, uh, say, uh, his domination, everything. And the, uh, the Pali Brahmins were very, very proud people. There was really much, much to for me to build on. So I could use my imagination. So in the case of Kuldhara, I think I had a very good uh, you know, canvas to start with. It was a fairly blank canvas with just a few thrown in and I could draw it. So that's the reason Kuldhara was easy for me to build. And uh, during research, certain new uh, information also pops up, doesn't it? Like, uh, like the Palivals, uh, whom, you know, uh, there are people uh, that community is still there. You you kind of uh, um, yes. found out uh, information about them, which has got other stories. You know, layers of other stories coming out when you go to discover one story. So can you talk about that also, yes. Malati? It was very interesting. Yeah, I definitely. In fact, I'm glad you brought this up. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I love. I'm so glad you brought this up because uh, this. This was, in, it was a very important part of my research, actually. And uh, what it led me to was only information on the Pali Wals, but it was priceless information. Because uh, while doing my research, I found out that these Pali Wal Brahmins had lived there, and they're a very small community, very insular uh, sort of community. And they did not, uh, you know, sort of, uh, they stayed who they were. They've always maintained their identity. So I managed to get, get in touch with a gentleman with the surname of Paliwal, who was a very proud Paliwal Brahmin. I didn't know him. I got his contact through somebody. And then I called him. He lives somewhere in Madhya Pradesh. I had a chat with him. And he told me the whole story, how they came up. And the story of the Paliwal is almost 5,000 years old. They got that far to the time of Krishna. So when Lord Krishna was, this is a sh story in very short. Uh, when Lord Krishna was the king of Dwarka and he was ruling over Dwarka, and uh, Rukmi, who was the prince of Vidarbha, when she, she wanted to marry him, but her father and her brother were trying to get her married to Shushupas, and she didn't die. So she sent a message to Krishna through a messenger, and she said, come and take me away. This is actually part of the story, one of the yeah. stories of the Mahabharata. So actually, they got that far because the person she chose to take her message to Krishna was a Brahma, was, sorry, was a Brahman. He was full of Vidarbha, and she told him, his name was Sukhiv, and she didn't please go and uh, give a message of mine in Dwar to Lord Krishna. So he took his full land with him along and all traveled and took a long time to come to uh, Dwar. And then he gave a letter, Rukmini's letter to Krishna. And so Krishna named them the Patriwals. He said, you are the Patriwals from today because you brought me the Patra, the letter. And of course, he went to Rukmini and she married her and ruled over Dwarka. And these people were very happy because under the tutelage of this royal people who looked after them. And because they were good people, Krishna sure they were very happy. But then the first came in Dwarka, which he made the Swafkads to come to destroy the evil force in Dwarka at that moment. And he said, I want you to move out your community to move away from Dwarka and go to another place called Pali. And Pali is based in Rajasthan. So he said, I want to go there and sit down there because that's are going to come destroy the evil people. So they all moved off to Ali and they settled down and they became very successful, very prosperous merchants. And after that, they, when they went there and they settled down, they became, they became known as the Ali Wars because they had to party to them. Very nice. Yeah. So then uh, what happened then they were uh, invaded from the north who came in and fought and they killed them. Very nice. And whoever was left, they, uh, they uh, escaped and they came down to Jaisalmer. Then they came to Jaisalmer and asked the king at that time, the Rabbit Sahib, they asked him, can I settle down? He said, I live in the desert living. If you can make something of it, you're welcome to something, else, but don't expect anything else from us. So 84 witches were set up in the desert. And they took sand to go, and they dug sweet water well, and uh, they do uh, beautiful crops, which were, you know, extremely good harvests they had, and they had stock, they had everything, and they became very successful. At that point in time, Salim told them that I would have to pay high taxes now, so you're so. So, this is a story how the powers came to be, and their story is, as I said, about 5,000 years. So this was really interesting that I heard from uh, one of my sisters. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you're, uh, you know, it's the living proof of 
uh, that uh, village having been occupied by the Paliwals and they were a flourishing community and uh, you know deserting, deserting uh, uh, whole villages 84 villages overnight is absolutely stunning uh, mm -hmm. story no doubt um, Malti so see one journey took you to this beautiful story which was received so well so have you uh, did, did that lead you to looking at your um, travels more differently to historical places let's just move on to Mandu how did that happen can you tell us how okay. Mandu happened yeah so Mandu was actually, I didn't really go out looking for a story, but as you know, these things all happened because we were India so rich history, rich in stories that we go away, we just have to keep eyes and ears open and you sense there's something here to write about. So that's happened to me, we went to Mandu. My daughter and I went and we did a daughter trip, it was very nice, a few years back. And we, we were both excited about it because we heard about Mandu as an, an abandoned fortress and so much we had about it. I know that a lot of people who know much about Mandu, but we had heard about it. So we went there and we told days a walk tour of the place with a very guide. And he told all the stories of Mandu and finally hit up with some Bas Mandu's story and how that Rukmati and what happened to them and the tragic uh, story of their uh, union, everything. So then when I came back I, and I, I carried a lot of photographs with me. Uh, so this picture you're seeing on the screen is the entrance to Kuldhara village. Yeah. Sujata, we can see those palaces. And then Sujata. we have photos of Mandu also, the abandoned doctors of Mandu that I have. Yeah. Uh, so we, we went and heard the story of Sultanas, Bahadur and Rukmati. It had a lot of uh, uh, potential to be made to a full length novel. So I decided to back. Then I did a lot of research. There was a lot of research in this for Mandu. More than for Dhara, I believe, because this one was rich in history at that time. This was 400 years back in the 16th century. That we, yeah. So there was a lot happening in central Hindustan. There was there was Bahasha in Gujarat. There was the uh, 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 good Maharani who was uh, Gavati. She very strong, very strong forces around. And in fact, I've described it as Mahu sitting like uh, you know, a very attractive maiden uh, in the set of so many vectors because they were all surrounding her. Mandu was center. All these different parts all around. So it just happened that Akbar came to know that there was a beautiful uh, sensation in Mandu and then said, it came with his arm to conquer Mandu. So uh, that is how uh, the story goes on. But uh, if you'd like an outline of the story, I could uh, quickly tell it. Yes, before that, um, so the basic thing was you were taken on a normal to uh, guide of uh, this um, uh, Mandu city and fortress of uh, Mandu, right? Yes. yes? And uh, then you just got this input yes. of uh, Rupmati and Bas Bahadur. Or how much information? Yeah, that is that important. Story. Yeah, I mean, but the input you got was that. And uh, <laughs> okay. did the story come to you immediately? That, you know, the moment uh, it was, uh, you know, told to you the, this romance <laughs> between a peasant girl and uh, uh, Bas Bahadur, uh, yeah. how did that, how did, how did it trigger the interest in you? Tell me. Yes, yeah, yeah, because it man. did trigger a lot of interest in me because this Sultan was a hand young man. And so did you say something? I said we are suckers for romance. <laughs> we uh, ladies in <laughs> <laughs> and we all are <laughs> that romantics, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So uh, yeah, the, so this chap um, um, uh, see the story starts Sultan Bazadu who's, uh, you know, very young, uh, some young, all those attractive men. This is, I mean, for the historical fact. And, but he was very decadent. He lived a decadent lifestyle. And he, there used to be, uh, you know, wine, women, and song every night. And he had a lot of concubines and all those things. But one day, he, oh, he and but he, his weakness was music and poetry. He was an exponent of Hindustani classical music. And he wrote ghazals. He wrote a lot of poetry, everything. So once he come down from the from the uh, Malwa Plateau down to next to the Narmada River, and where they, when he was hunting over there, he heard this uh, sweet sound of singing, and then he saw this uh, woman who was a young woman, beautiful young woman who was singing Hindustani classical. So he found it so attractive. He didn't think of her beauty at that time. He just thought of her as a singing partner. 
So he decided to take her back. And of course, those days, the sultans could do what they wanted. But when he went to ask her father, the father said, no, she will not go anywhere where she cannot see the Narmada every day. So you have to find a way to show her the Narmada, otherwise she will come with. Of course, father knows he could keep saying this man, just uh, walk off her. But uh, uh, his uh, son, Baz Bahad, was good enough, to, uh, had a sense of honor. And he said, okay, I'll find a way. So he went back to his fort and he found that there is a building from which if you look over the wall, you could see a trickle of Narmada in the plains. So he took back with him. And initially, she was not at all happy. She's, I have developed her character as a bit of a feminist, where though she listens, but she has her ideas and she's found her conditions very clear. So yeah, Malik, that's then, most fantastic part. Uh, uh, that's one part I wanted to discuss in detail with you is you, your stories are historical. So we are talking about medieval times and centuries past, but your your yes. uh, stories, uh, novels are all women centric. Definitely, the protagonist is. There are more powerful characters involved, but uh, basically the main uh, character is uh, Rukmati here. And um, though they are under their circumstances, they have got their own uh, uh, difficulties and uh, things like that. But you show them to be strong. Uh, that is something which really really engages us because you know we are able to relate with that where you know in spite of their circumstances they emerge uh, strong so can you talk about that we, we, we really love that yes. uh, part in, uh, in my book i have a, a, a woman protagonist who starts off point of view because in this you have rukmati had no choice she was a victim of circumstance she was just taken away from home and from her mother she was taken away to mandot and there, by this, of course, was a very nice young man. But the fact she was not interested to go anywhere, where she's not saying in the Narmada River and see the river green because she worshipped the Narmada. This was all historical. And then uh, he went there, and I have created another character of, of a wife, a sultan, a young woman who's uh, been neglected badly over the years, but she does not have his interests. So Heba, that's her name. He bows down to point of weeks. So we have two women, main protagonist and second protagonist, that is about. So both of them start from a point of extreme weakness where they have, they are dependent on the men for their very lives and how they how they conduct their lives. But by the end of the book, I have seen them emerge strong in every and to take land to their own hands and live as they thought was right for them. And to yes. do they thought the right thing, they both do. And the same thing in Kuldhara also. I have women, Pasbari, the one who's uh, uh, sort of fed away by the uh, Sultan and her whole family and her community. And the other one is the son's wife, who was very needy, who also was emotionally in the abode. Sorry, in Sultan, uh, Salim Singh, the Prime Minister's wife. We put Kuldhara. So, uh, Prime Minister's wife, one of her wife, who was the main wife. She was already needy, she needed. So, but both of them acting from such points within the framework of triarchy, they both come stronger at the end of the book. So yes. that's what I just wanted to say this, that up to us as writers to give it that twist because yes. we don't know how they lived those days. Definitely very regressive. Their society yes. is very regressive. Yes, but at the same time, you see um, this universal bond, uh, the sisterhood that develops between the women characters, you know, there are the negative ones also but not really negative as such. You find uh, the confidant of um, uh, Rukmati, she, you portray her as a very learned uh, woman too. She's actually a maid come confident. She turns into a confidant later. So even she's a learned person and uh, you know, there's a beautiful bond between them. Similar to what's happening between Parvati and uh, Pari. Yes, Parvati and Pari, and before Parvati and her maid, yes. who is, I think, uh, Hira, Hira is her name. Ah. So we have, uh, in both my books, you will find that I believe that women are women's best friends, and they can be the, the support system, they can be the sisters, they can be the philosophers and guides that every woman needs to have, especially in, at a point of, you know, this kind of crisis that each of them has gone through. So in uh, Rukmati's case, we have this little woman, I would call her small woman because she actually a 
but and so she doesn't have a family of her own. She doesn't have a life of her own. So, but she's she becomes very attached to Rukmati. When Sultan this this woman to look to Rukmati, she comes stays as a companion and takes care of her and guides her and sort of provides all the succor that she actually needs. And uh, in the other tale also, where uh, Pali being the wife of Salim Singh. She all needs a support, and her servants are all the support right up to them. And so I believe that women can be women's best friends, and I like to bring that out in my books a lot. <laughs> yes, yes, this is something we also in the Duchess Club go to say. You know that women are women's greatest uh, friends. It always um, resonates friends. with us. It resonates with us. Uh, you know, women readers of yours would re really, you know. Um, you know, relate with that fact. So the story uh, now takes a tragic end, Correct. and your Correct. hero, hero, in spite of a uh, feat of clay, he, you do start liking him. So how do you portray a person like the British? Say we have all led uh, the sultans and people. They led a luxurious life, almost to be known as a degenerate life. But in spite of you, Phil, you make him. Uh, likeable. So how that? How does that happen? How do you do portray him like that? Okay. So see, I believe that for yes, uh, I believe that you know there should be no blacks and whites. There should be no characters which are just black or just white. I really believe in this. And if for a protagonist, whether it be male protagonist, or female protagonist, I believe in making him in shades of it because everyone has. Uh, you know, minus points and negative points, and in spite of it, he has to be attractive to the reader. So that is just the way I uh, sort of play around with the character, and I make sure that he is attractive. Because what really matters to women at the end of the day, uh, to a woman reader, let's say, what what really matters is his sensitivity. That's very important. Then, because even if he's uh, he's got a lot of negative characteristic traits, but he still he's a very sensitive man. He stands by his word. So the things are very different. So the right things are attractive. The other things we can forget. Well, okay. That's how true. It works. true. And uh, Malti, may I just uh, uh, you know interrupt now and ask Sujata to show us the pictures of that uh, Jazz Mahal and the things, so that you can uh, tell us how you know how uh, beautifully you were able to um, you know develop the stories, uh, Sujata. Uh, the, what is this picture? Uh, okay. Yeah. Malti? This picture is called the Rukmati Hell. It has been wrongly named as Rukmati Hell because she lived here. Because see, that's what there's so many discrepancies, so many mistakes in the uh, sources. So I had to do a lot of research to know that this was just a, a soldier's barracks type building. Which, but you see on the right of it, right, the picture that is the wall which goes around the fort. That's part of the wall which you can see. So this comes about the boundary wall of the fort, and from the right side pavilion, that is the pergola on the right side, you could look down into plains and see the uh, Nara River. Nara. So this is what he was. This is very close to Baz's palace. It's uh, just a few steps you up that little mount, and then you go up to the walk up to the test and you could enter the terrace. you can look so he just said that i wrote mati here because every day she can go up and see the narmada river and then she do her puja and eat yeah. yet, so not, unless you put this yes way. yes and uh, huh, this one this one is so beautiful please tell us about this and how it inspired you it's almost like you know these monuments beckon you and tell you to breathe life into them malati like you know you have uh, You've woven your story around the corridors of this palace, and uh, of course, the next picture which will come will yes. be the uh, bath. Also, uh, I, you have created yes. so many beautiful scenes around it. So, just tell us what this one is yes. right now. Okay, so this is Jahan Hell. This is the Jahan Hell, which uh, looks like a ship. Jahan's new ship in him. So this is a long, beautiful building, three stories high, and it it has a lake in front of it and a lake behind. And in the morning, these lakes would fill up the very top. And then, as you saw, almost to the top, come uh, to the entrance at the entrance at the bottom. So it comes up, and then the whole thing looks like a ship sailing on the sea. So that is why it was known as the Jahaz Mahal. And yes, this Jahaz. actually was by a previous sultan. Uh, his name was Giyas Khan, and he built it for his concubines. He had a lot of concubines. He wanted to at least accommodate 
a few thousand of them in this. He had 15,000 apparently. So he <laughs> wanted to accommodate some of them in this building. So he built Jahaz just for them. It has some very beautiful features. Uh, on one end of Jahaz uh, at one level, there's a test which has a tortoise shaped pool. And uh, all the concubines gather around the pool and, you know, their feet inside would dance and would uh, sort of bathe there. And then the men would come and pick them up, whoever wanted. These were activities that happened every night. And then on the top there again, there's another pool, shaped in loose. So the things that were, uh, you know, there were so many features that are still there now. Even today, you can see this Jahaz male as it was in those days. Okay. So this is the second build that I talked about. Yes. And the pool there. Yeah, the this pool. is an important building. This actually was Bahadur's palace, part of Bahadur's palace, which was built in the courtyard style. It had a series of courts, one after another. This is the last court that you see, which had a pool in the center, and he used to bathe in very often. So I have several summer events around this place, in this place, and then also rooms back and all in the corridors and billiard. Uh, you know, those uh, passages, all this I have talked about. But this pool is an important part of Baba's palace because he loved being in water. And she was, he used to call her Jalpari. Jalpari. That means like, water with water because she was always very fond of watering in water. So they used this a lot. Once they both fell in love and started living in the palace together, they used to use the pool a lot in my story. So I'll never forget that beautiful pool because you created some of the most uh, most intimate and romantic scenes around this pool and uh, you did you know we also gained a lot of information on how the pool is filled with water you know getting water up to the fort and you know filling up these pools is, these are all uh, elements that you get to learn so the main yes. story was romance uh, um, malati but you beautifully woven you created these new characters Kiba being the wife and her mother who's, uh, well, you know, out of concern for her daughter. She's uh, kind of on the villainous side, I would say, but not really. It was her motherly instincts yes. which tried to, so, and tell me, uh, so, even in her case, her yeah. case. So uh, what, uh, Kiba, I have to say was that, um, uh, they don't, sorry. No, in Heba's case, her uh, main thing was her no. obsession with Bas and, uh, you know, um, how she overcame that also, you know, basically what I, I'm interested yes. in is you have created these uh, um, characters and then woven your story so beautifully. So there is, um, you know, this longing for a husband and obsession for a person who's not interested in you. And then uh, the Sultan himself yes. uh, having certain nice qualities of being uh, interested in music. Then there's a little bit of conspiracy. There's a little bit of intrigue and everything woven in to make it a perfectly beautiful novel. So talk about those characters too and your uh, story in general. Okay, so uh, it's, uh, when I started this, I realized we just, history just gives me two characters. One is Bas and one is Rukmati. That was, and then we had a in his court, Antam Khan was his Sinapati, other his Sipas, Sipasala, that is the Mughal Sinapati. That was a milk Adam Khan was uh, there, Agra, so in Agra. And we just had four characters to start. So I had built characters to build certain uh, conspiracy. I had to build them, yes, build them into story in such a way of the plot form. Because the plot had to finally end up where the climax can change. What happens at the end of their story has to be the same. It's a historical story. So I had to take uh, a character events and the plot in such a way that it had the same point as in history. So I uh, created this character of Heba, his first wife. Then I created a character of her brother, one dark, sour old lady who is always very uh, grim and uh, she's she's plotting all the time. And she's actually, even she has shades because she's a mother at the end of the day. She is not exactly all black. So she is, she feels for her daughter. She says, we we'll find a way to bring back you since one of yes. to me. And then she plots. And how she plots to bring Adam Khan's army here from Agha to make sure that Akbar sends the army. That is the crux of the story. So we have a plot by Jana Bhim, who, uh, uh, who actually uh, some entices Adam to come and Rukmati away. And this 
uh, price of wood. She says, he'll be your price of wood, just come take her a black to Agra. So Hatam Khan is instigated to tell her, I want to conquer territory. Actually, he's coming for Rukmi. Yeah. So when the first as is not all prepared, his army is not prepared, is not prepared in any way. So what happens after that is where we will find out in the time. Yes, yes. It's a beautiful story and there's so much to it. And uh, as history always uh, tells, you know, the short-sightedness of somebody brings the ruin of a, a, a beautiful place. Like the mother is only concerned about her yes. own daughter's thing and she invites an army over to kind of destroy the place. So, and, um, and uh, this, a very sad, uh, tragic end, of course, is, is a poetic end, I would say. Yeah. So that was, uh, that was so wonderful. Yeah. So now, uh, going on to uh, Malu, uh, would like to know how the mind of a writer works. This actually interests me a lot. And I'm sure my audience also would like to know how, how you get to, uh, you know, build on stories. How does it work for you? How does it work for you? Like you visit places, you see places, you hear things, and how does it go? Okay. Um, actually, uh, for writer, I think it's uh, it's a way. Uh, okay, let me put it this way: that I write. You know, I'll just uh, Shivakri ma'am who said that for the reader, it's a very intimate experience. You're going to reading a book and getting absolutely an intimate relationship that develop with characters. I will put as uh, as writer, I develop an intimate relationship with all my characters, with the whole story. So for me, it's like uh, if you know Alice through the King Glass, uh, if she didn't mention the magical beyond that, Lewis Carroll's Alice in the through the Looking Glass. For me, it was uh, it's always that my computer screen is my Looking Glass. Once mm -hmm. I sit down at my computer and I start writing, I enter that magical world. And for me, every character is a member of my life, you know, is a part yes. of my life. So I create these characters and I live with them every day, I write my books. It's um, a very exciting thing because it's a world out there which yeah. I'm entering every day, write and come back into my own world. And then I'm dying to go back inside again. <laughs> so that is uh, the crux of how I feel about my books and my characters. Yeah. And how do I go out it is, uh, it's always some of an idea from side which excites me. As I said, Kuldhara, the, uh, there was that uh, feeling that, you know, did people feel that night when they abandoned their homes and went into the, completely into the open without knowing where they're going to go. And then uh, in Rukpati's case, again, I said she left her home and she went into Mandar just to stay in the forest with an unknown person. What did she feel? And it, she all had was music. That's it. And she put on that. Malvi, so two people whose lives were with Sorry to interrupt. I'm really curious. How yeah. do, why, why don't you read a few pages if you have marked some already to read? Is there any special uh, page that you would like to read for us? Yes, definitely. I'll do that. So basically yeah. what I was saying is that uh, it's, it's very important for me to feel that need to write about them. And I build my characters and the plot. The plot is very important, of course. We have to have a plot. It has to have events. And then uh, once I start writing, there's no looking back. Then it just starts flowing. So okay. the research, the plot, characters, and then the writing. That's how okay. it is. Okay. I can, uh, I'll read from Mandu. Yes, from Mandu, please. Listeners, you're going to enjoy this a uh, lot. I talked a lot about... Uh, I have talked a lot about the uh, beauty of Man at night, Shabi Mwa, that is beauty of Mandu fortress at night. So I'd like to read a little bit about it. Uh, the first night when she sits in Mandu and she goes to her window, she has no idea where she's come. She's just been brought in a palki, in a closed palki. She's been brought here and she's been left in her Shahi Mahal. And then the Sultan goes back, leaving her with a companion. Uh, but in the night, she's not able to sleep because she's so far from home. Ruby. And uh, so she goes to the window and then it's a mind-blowing sight what she sees. The scene that met her eyes was no less than the mantle sight of a celestial abode of gods. It was as the whole sky had heated its chest star onto the sea of Mount. Lights started from every building, lights on the rooftops, excuse, flaring. Malti, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Maybe you could use that microphone. Your voice is kind of uh, uh, echoing. 
So can you use the mic uh, close to you? Oh. Is it convenient? Oh, okay. No, they can't use it. They can't use it. They can't use it. <laughs> Should I disconnect mic and try? Should I yeah. press? Is this clear for you? Ah, yeah. This might be better, Malti, because it was echoing a bit. Is it better? Yeah, it's better. Just read okay. a few okay. lines. We okay. might okay. be able to make it. Yeah. Okay. Just does this sound clearer now? Yes. Yes. It won't. I don't know if it will be clear really. It is. Should I? It is. Just to say. Yeah? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Oh. okay. Sorry, I interrupted you. I lost my page. No, no problem. I just lost my page. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. So sorry. Right. No problem. I'll read another part. There's another part also. Which sure, is, sure. Okay. Sure. This is about the evening. Uh, this is evening gang of music lovers with a mehfil, where both uh, Paz and Rukmati would sit every evening to sing. I would just like to give you a feel of that. The evening gathering of music lovers, the mehfil, would begin after the day cooled and the sun sank, leaving the world poised and quivering with anticipation. A cacophony of bird calls filling the ears like clamoring silver bells. The evening skies would scurry away to dress themselves up in honor of another bewitching night in Mandu. They would turn when the lamps had been lit all over the city and the sounds of music and gungroos ran in the, uh, rang in the air and they would glimmer gold in the waters of the lakes and fountains and flicker silver in the shadows of the forests. So interesting was the night of the city that they say even the creatures of day, the peak and the pigeon and partridge would hide behind pillars and in the crevices of rafters to catch a glimpse of the celebrations night after night in the fall. In the Shahi Mehel, where um, was, in the Shahi Mehel, not to build, they faced covered by two hanging guts to gather the main of audience, plush with its carpets and cushions the wide windows overlooking the Munj Talab and the illuminated complex of palaces. The evening would win with the tune of the instruments, a tamra here and a beam sitar there, a sali here and a tabla there. Soon the air throbbed the beat of the tabla and the drone of the tanpura setting the pitch. Then she comes in after that. And how does she come? Sadia, can you know me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Sadia, her little companion, would comes inside. First bus comes in and sings a few snatches of Then a tiny fellow would totter into the chamber, sit him low and announce in her deep, dark voice, sultan e malwa badshah e jahan I solicit your permission to announce the end of Bibi Rukmati. Ustar Muzik, the sultan's first musician in Malu, the city Shadia Bad, the precious jewel malwa. Baz smiled and raised his hand, Sadia back to the door, waving her palm to and from chin. As Baz watched, Rukmati walked slowly, her palms joined together in a namaste. She was dressed in a cotton knee of a mustard color with a border woven in dark brown and pale green thread, her hair loosely plaited down to her hips. A red bindi adorned her forehead, but beyond that, she wore no ornaments. As she settled down, her gaze slowly, the shyly sought other singers, and the audience stood along the wall, and meeting their eyes through zarbucked veils, she smiled and keen. So they start singing after that. So uh, one of the things that comes out, which I wanted to uh, put, I want to miss, she changes her Hindu culture, her simplicity, as yeah. far as Shan, and it is only later in Baal's insist that at least or he requests her to be wearing his, uh, the clothes of his culture, the lehenga. Then she says, okay. But till then, she maintains and she has the navy with a four piece dress that they wore in central Hindustan 16th century. So that's also a part of your research what they wore during those times, yeah. what the women were wearing, and the colors that uh, went with it. Uh, the rich clothes would be richer in color and, and a lot of work and all that. Everything has been described so beautifully in the um, thing. And then, of course, we have the turn of events, the army coming and going, and uh, the um, uh, novel ends in a very, very poetic way. So we, we would, I'd, I'd like to hear the epilogue also. 
Uh, Malati, if you could just yeah, continue finish. to read that part. It was absolutely mesmerizing, the With epilogue pleasure. of the story. Yeah. <laughs> okay. When the main story is over, there's a little epilogue. I generally write a little epilogue because I, that is something I would like to leave my readers with. It's a, it's a thought, it's an emotion, it's just a mood that I like to leave them with. So this is the epilogue of Mandu. When Vasritu comes to Mava, they say the river brings new light to her valley. The meadows, forests burst in such vibrant colors that holy, the festival spring steps back quietly and is tempted to slip away. But up in the toe in Mandu, where the mother of Falun was once welcomed with the spring of color playing prank, the swirling of skirts and the clang of hands. Now they say, in Mandu, the goddess of spring tiptoes quietly from Meh to Mehen, looking for something, for someone in vain. For the moments lay in darkness, harrowed is sorrow and stayed by pain. The eternal tombs of another era. But wait, how? Is that a snap of a distant song on the air? Or is only the morning wind the ravens of Malva? No. Beautiful, uh, Malati. That's a beautiful end to a lovely no novel. And I'm sure only reading it will, uh, you know, yeah, one has to go through the experience. Like the way you say you run back to write your lines. We, you know, we have to leave your book for a certain time and go. And then it's like a longing, you know, you want to come back, run back to the book and read. And, you know, you mark your pages. So that's same the relationship kind of between a, a, reader, a reader and the book is the same kind of longing, you know. Like we leave it because we have to cook, we have to clean. So we, uh, you know, mark our pages and run. And then we long back to come back and take the book and go back to this, you know, imaginary world. So they do say that for writing, the method of writing, uh, you have to be uh, well versed in the language and then you need to have certain amount of training on how to, the methodology, how to write extra because in, in, within all of us, there are some budding aspiring writers. So you have to indulge us, uh, Malati. So we would like to know, um, uh, just want to know that Apart from this, one has to have a lot of ideas, isn't it? Like uh, a mind which is full of ideas. You can teach people the method, but uh, you can't teach people how to get ideas, isn't it? So I uh, so see, there's what's a, your see, take on that? Yeah. So what I would say is actually there's a uh, saying in the writer's world. It says there are only twelve plots in the world. Whatever do you will come to one of them. There's okay. nothing more than that. There are only two basic plots in the world. So if you look at that, how do we write original? So that is where your creativity comes in. Even a simple story can be made, you can own it by writing it in your own way, give it your own flavor, your own touch. So I would say that first exit is, first I is the first important. But I think what is more important is to give an original touch, totally ah. refreshing touch. As we say, Shakespeare was the person who said, uh, you know, her, uh, cheese as, uh, is like the little of hose. He said, uh, use that three first. Anybody who says a fool, because you're just repeating something which has already been said. So I think one has to say something very original. That is most important for writing. Right. And we have to think out of the box. And out with freshness, what we write. So, uh, I mean, beyond normal, you know, uh, how to knowing how to create a plot, how to create characters, these are all important. But at the end of the day, I think it really makes a stand up be the friends it brings to the readers. Yeah, yeah. You know, actually, I would like to point out we have a member, um, and uh, a senior member, who her name is Mangala Kandur. Okay, she kind of. Uh, she she doesn't write books, but she's on Facebook. Her posts are I, the, those are ones which I've never missed. You know, it is straightforward and honest, absolutely as honest as today. Mm. I woke up at six o'clock and opened my window to see. You know, that's the way her her writing goes. But there is so much of honesty, okay. a simplicity in her writing mm. that it keeps you. Uh, you know, I have never, uh, you know, uh, put like on her uh, 
post and just uh, scroll down, you know. That, that kind of writing is also very appealing, mm. Malati, where you know, a person is downright honest and, you know, open mm. about her. It is very interesting to read her posts. And I always Beautiful. think that she must be a huge, loving, lovely she is. So as a writer, even mm. you write a post, that is also writing, isn't it? If it is not a novel, but yet it is that style of writing is extremely appealing. Absolutely. There is no doubt that you, there you're expressing the freshness of your thoughts. So there, then there's an original yeah. thinking that you're expressing and that's what we want to, they want to hear anything which is original. Yes. Not the same and you can relate with it very easily. You can relate with it very easily to that style of writing. I mean, you, you may not suit a, yes. a fiction and all that, but basically I'm just saying as a way of communicating with another person, Sometimes these styles also uh, are very, very uh, appealing. And uh, tell me, do you have your moments? Very, very, yeah, do you have your moments when you write you're stuck somewhere and you get, oh no, uh, getting a little grrr kind of feeling? Does that come to you anytime as a writer? Uh, are you talking about a creative block, mental block, writer's yeah. block? Yes, yes. Writer's block. Writer's block. Yes, of course it happens. It happens. All writers we get stuck at some point, and you just know how to go forward. And something happens that you've written something, and you read it, and you say this is horrible, and you just delete it. And you know, it, it may have been a day's work. You may have put yeah. a full chapter the day before. The next day, you get up and you read it, and you say, "What nonsense is this?" And you just delete all the starting. So there are those moments, as you say, are definitely has. Yeah. But um, as far as, uh, you know, the, the creative block, I think it's, uh, it doesn't exist. Because ah. why you, uh, once you start writing, the creativity does, the ah. ideas do come. You may not write your best that day, or you may not be able to uh, say what you want to say. But I think uh, creativity is an inbuilt thing, you know. It's ah. a part of our nature. And if once we decided we want to write this book and we got a plot ready, I think uh, the ideas will just, uh, should come. So I, I, I'm not, uh, you know, I don't know. Uh, yeah. Uh, creative can happen. Yes, yeah. there are writers. <laughs> because one, I remember reading one famous author who said, people who go to book events, I'd just like to tell them that, you know, uh, if, if the author who's sitting on the stage can write it, you can write too. But the only thing is you must overcome the uh, thought of throwing your laptop out of the window, <laughs> overcome the uh, thing because, you know, <laughs> that kind of effort goes and it's not all that easy. You know, that's what, you know, I was, I was wondering, what is she saying? Then I realized, she says, if you can overcome the uh, emotion to throw your laptop through out of the window, then maybe you can also become an author. <laughs> so... Tell me, tell me. <laughs> so, okay. So, uh, Malti, do you have a uh, writer's work, like your favorite seat, your favorite place to write? Oh, yes, absolutely. This is the room I always sit. This yeah. has got all my books. It's got my music. It's got everything here. My, uh, you know, my, uh, what do you say? Um, uh, my uh, lazy boy chair where I can read. So, I'll show it to you. <laughs> Oh, you will be lost that. in that. that. Read to the you window. I've got a, that. Yeah, it's really nice. So I sit and read. I've got a garden looking uh, window over here, which looks that out of my garden. And I've got a computer. My computer is my life. So once okay. I sit down at it, I'm back in my, back in form, I'll say. And I'm yeah. happy. That's what my life. Wonderful. Wonderful talking to you, Malti. I'll just check if any of my friends want to ask anything. Is there any questions for Malati? Because uh, I am not very sure if anybody read your book. So I would, uh, you know, like them to pick up your book and read it because I've enjoyed it thoroughly and uh, enjoyed talking to you also, Malti. Uh, Sujata, can we have a uh, go on? Anu is there on screen. Anu Sachdev is there. Jeez. Anu, is there anything you want to ask something? No, not really ask. I just said that the conversation was so enthralling that it's taken us to a different era altogether, Malti. Thank you so much. I'm really eagerly looking forward to recreating uh, your, uh, you know, your, your, you know, visually trying to recreate those moments in your book, you know, the romance and the way you deciphered every character. You brought a bunch of life into them 
and uh, really really look forward to reading your book and um, you. your in depth study about the history and the way you would probably go about you know getting the best info about the character and then you know writing out it you know connecting them together i mean amazing amazing yes. thank you so much pleasure and we really thank looking you. forward you have sort of build the romance in all members <laughs> we all are just looking forward to <laughs> you must, you must read I mean, it with experience color. thank yeah. you so much uh, thank you so much um, multi there's several more questions on you know how difficult it is to publish a book and all that also it's it's, it's a part of it you know yes, yes, writing know. is one major thing and then going on to getting a publisher to publish your book and you know getting this kind of um, reviews yes, and yes, things yes. like that um i think it's where is your book available now you can talk to tell us a few things about that uh, then yeah. i want to your book my, my, is, my book is available both the paperback as well as kindle edition in amazon huh. so it's very much available on amazon and probably a few other sites because now it's okay. all available only on online sites at present okay later okay. it'll go into the physical uh, book shop but now in all the online So, are you fully charged to you know take on more historical uh, um, fiction writing, uh, Malti? That is the response encourages I'm, you. In fact, I'm liking it so much. Yeah, <laughs> I'm enjoying it so much that I feel I would like to do the next few books. I've already got ideas lined up for the next three books, which I would Ooh, like uh, to do. Right? Yeah. Uh, so you know, uh, I think it's I I think I found my way. That's <laughs> my wonder. Uh, uh, Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful! Because you're an avid traveler, and you go to places, doing your homework first, and after that, you have this tremendous capacity to absorb stories and uh, other facts and things about every place. I mean, you you're extremely resourceful when it comes to that. So I'm sure we will, uh, and I will get some private uh, narrations as 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 such, no, as usual. Shall I take that promise out of you? <laughs> okay. That awesome. is between two dog good friends and two his bumps. <laughs> yes. I get the privilege of uh, getting the first uh, first uh, sketch of the thing. I get to hear, and it's lovely to get yes, out yes, of yes. the author's um, uh, narration itself. You know, it's been wonderful, and I'm so delighted to have you on our forum here today, uh, Malathi. Uh, it's really wonderful that you could come over and uh, and uh, at, on a very auspicious uh, day for us it's a day of book launch so here's to more reading and enjoying more books uh, on the whole duchess members i'm very very thrilled to have um, uh, you know had a conversation with uh, malathi ramchandran and um, best wishes to our book club thank you i'll take leave from you all now thank you kala kala thank you, you are so beautiful you. i mean asked the right questions and you know created a kind of a you know peaked our interest in all the in the books that uh, alti has written we are really looking forward and those pictures malti are amazing you know it really takes you to a different uh, world altogether i would say you know yes. so all the best for your future book. thank you and um, And you know the mind you read, so as you say. It thank you, dreams, Kala. You know? Thank you to the so, Duchess uh, Club. I mean, it's. Wait, hold on. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, all of you, for having me here today. It's a great honor, and I really enjoyed myself. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Wonderful, thank wonderful you. interaction. Thank you. Bye, bye, bye Malathi. Thank you. Bye, bye. Bye, friends. See you, Kala. Bye. See you. Thank you, Kala. Bye. Will Sujata come on now, or yes. can you all see? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. One second. Are we'll you also? Even Nina is there. No, I think everybody is here. Yeah. Okay, we've taken a picture before uh, Anu. Yeah. Yeah. You want me to call her? You want me to call her? No, no, it's okay. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. It's okay. Okay. All of you members can come on to your video now. We can take a group picture. All of you can come on to the video. So, I hope I didn't overshoot the time, ma. No, not at all. Okay. No, no, no. It was perfect. It was perfect. And lovely okay. questions. Beautiful questions.